and welcome to Meet Your Alderman, a podcast that seeks to inform Chicagoans about the people who represent them. Last time, we spoke with Desmond Yancey, one of the two candidates to replace longtime Fifth Ward Alderwoman Leslie Hairston. In this episode, we sat down with the other candidate in the runoff, Tina Hone. Tina grew up in Chicago, graduated from the University of Chicago, and later moved to Washington, D.C., where she worked in a variety of government and policy roles. Having returned to Chicago years ago, she most recently served as Chief Engagement Officer under Mayor Lightfoot. She's touted herself as an experienced candidate who hopes to leverage her background in the fight for social justice and equity, and we hope you'll learn a lot from our conversation. So we have with us today Miss Tina Hone, a candidate for Alderman of the Fifth Ward, where we're sitting right now. And our first question for you, Tina, is what motivated you to run for Alderman and at this specific point in time? Yeah, it's a great question. So I grew up in Chicago and was born in Hyde Park, went to UFC, have been part of the Fifth Ward for a very long time. Um, I spent most of my career career in Washington, D.C., working on a range of public policy matters that really focus on civil rights, social justice, leveling the playing field. I came home to Chicago about seven years ago. My husband died sort of suddenly and unexpectedly. Um, I wasn't going to work again. I came home. I was going to be in the fetal position on my mother's couch for the rest of my life. And then I kept hearing about all the challenges going on in the city, which were the same challenges that were going on in the city when I was a, a young person in the city. Um, And I decided to get back to work, went back to work at YWCA as chief equity officer and eventually ended up in the mayor's office as chief engagement officer. And while in the mayor's office, what I saw was how the city worked and how the city didn't work. When this opportunity came up and sort of sort of mystically, it came up on my husband's birthday, I started taking a look at it and thinking, you know, I came back to Chicago with a set of skills and knowledge and understanding that most people in Chicago politics don't have. And I also had the experience of working in the city and knowing what levers to pull to get things done. And I thought that combination of experiences, plus my unique personal background, my mom's African-American, my father was an immigrant from the former Yugoslavia. Um, I know what it is to be poor. I grew up in a low income, high expectation home, but I also know what it is to seize the opportunities of the Fifth Ward, having graduated on Dean's List from UFC. And so all of that together made me feel like not only could I effectively represent everyone in this ward because of my skill set, but I could effectively represent everyone in this ward because of my personal connections to the challenges and opportunities that the people in this ward are facing. Wow. I had only kind of a glimpse of all of that background from many things that we've done in terms of research. So thank you so much for painting that picture for all of our listeners as well as for us. I would say, and we probably won't harp on this too much, but was kind of curious about some of the work you've done both at the federal and local levels, obviously in Washington, as well as in Chicago, um, and just curious how that's kind of informed your approach to politics. Sure. So one of the things that was is very different working in Washington is that there really is an, an aisle with another side of it, right? There are Republicans and Republicans are really far right um, that you have to you know, figure out how to work with. And there are Democrats who, you know, lean even far, further left than me. And I'm a pretty left leaning Democrat. I was able to build coalition and alliances across a real aisle. Um, And you do that by working with people, not by antagonizing people or backing them into a corner, but trying to figure out where that common ground is. Um, One of my greatest victories, which is actually kind of a fail, I actually had a really good relationship with the Republican counterpart um, on the Judiciary Committee that I was working with. And it was a piece of legislation, really arcane, so I won't get into it, but Um, I basically said to him, I've got you on this. I've got 30 Republicans. He says, there's no way you've got 30 Republicans. And so I made a deal with those 30 Republicans that I would hold the Democrats from voting first. So they came out right out the bat, 30, you know, votes from the red side of the aisle. Bam, 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 bam. And George, my my counterpart's name is George, looked at me from across the aisle and I'm like, told you. Um, And then we let the Democrats loose. What happened because of that was there was a tie. um, And on a tie, if it's your motion, you lose, if you know Robert's rules. 
And the Republicans had to hold that vote open for like 45 minutes. It is unheard of. They actually had to find Newt Gingrich to come down to the floor because the speaker never really votes to vote. So I still count it as a victory, even though I lost because they had to cheat and wait 45 minutes to find their speaker to, right. to, to beat me. No, awesome. I hear that. Thank you for sharing that story. That's very just a great anecdote. And yeah, indicates how you're able to use social capital and use you know, just your relationships with people to really try to bring people together on different issues. Well, we're going to turn a little bit more to the nuts and bolts of the race and the issues facing Chicago. So what issues do you think would be your priorities to address while on the city council? So there are three buckets that are really important to me, obviously public safety. And but like many of the other folks who are talking about public safety, it's both about making policing better, more efficient, more effective, more just. Right. There's a reason why there were so many calls for police reform. Um, there's been a lot of broken trust between the police department and communities of color in particular. So but we still need policing. There are still bad actors and we need law enforcement. But at the same time, we have to deal with the root causes. And so opportunities for kids and opportunities for the parents of kids. Right. Because a lot of these kids are growing up in homes where their parents are hopeless. And that's that's no good. The trauma, the joblessness, the, um, uh, you know, hunger, all of those things those root causes that we have to deal with have to happen. So public safety for me is both law enforcement and root cause work. In addition, we have to build thriving communities and people who have met me on the campaign trail. And I'm starting to feel like this is UFC, so UFC will get what I'm talking about, but there's an economic ecosystem. And when that economic ecosystem becomes unbalanced, when you've got poverty on top of poverty, or even at the other end, wealth, that doesn't have any exposure to the struggles, um, it makes creates distortions, right? And so one of the reasons Hyde Park is such a thriving community is that there's an economic ecosystem here, right? And it's a pretty balanced one. Um, you know, we have students, we have people who are struggling. There are low-income people in Hyde Park, um, and there are middle-class people, and they're really, they're affluent people, Nobel Prize winners and all that kind of stuff. But we have this balanced ecosystem in Hyde Park. Lincoln Park is not a balanced ecosystem. And you see it because it's so segregated, right? If it were a balanced ecosystem, you'd see more people of color living in Lincoln Park, right? Um, because we know that like African-Americans and other people of color are struggling more, right? And so that's not a balanced ecosystem, but it's also not a balanced ecosystem in South Shore, for example, where you have poverty living on top of poverty. We need a stronger middle class um, in South Shore. Um, and that's incredibly important. And the third bucket that I talk about is really changing the way our city is governed. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. One third of city council new, new mayor. We can reset the way city government works. Uh, the Chicago way does not have to be the way. So on that, actually really continuing, I do think there has been a pretty profound shift in how a lot of aldermen see their role in the past few years. Maybe less so as a rubber stamp for the mayoral agenda and more as a legislator. So I'm just curious, how do you see your particular role as an alder person? And what do you think would be your office's balance between legislating and then addressing issues specific to the Fifth Ward? So I think, one, coming out of the federal system, I understand and it really cut my teeth on a balanced government and true co-governance. There is a strong executive branch and a strong legislative branch. And so that's what I think we're missing in Chicago. I'm not trying to make a weak mayor, but I'm trying to make a strong city council. I think the other thing that's important as an alderman is that what you really are for your community is you're an advice, you're an advocate, and you're an ombudsman. You're helping your people navigate the system. And so I think there's almost a 50-50 balance. And if I had to skew in any direction, I would probably skew more towards taking care of my constituents. But I actually think it's close to 50-50 because I have a responsibility to make sure that the systems are working in our city and in our ward, that the potholes are fixed and the lights are, 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 are on and all of those other things. But on the other side of the equation, one of the most important things I can do for my constituents is have a city that's working efficiently. And that's more of a policy play, right? And, um, and so I, I, I think there's a pretty even balance. And I think what's unique about me, uh, particularly compared to my um, opponent is, I don't believe he's ever worked in the federal system. He hasn't worked on legislation in the way that I've worked on legislation. So that's really what, what I believe. I do wanna make one comment though. A lot of the people who have come to city council 
don't understand that we are legislators. And so when I even saw it on the campaign trail, what are you going to do? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. No, you're going to learn to count to 25, right? Because as a legislator, you don't, you're not an executive and what, how you get things done is by working in partnership in a coalition with colleagues. And so you learn to count to 25. You don't just grandstand. Mm. I think that's great insight, especially from your time at the federal government. Um, And you kind of brought this up. So we want to jump into the question of what do you believe are the greatest differences between you and Desmond Yancey? uh, And what are maybe some similarities or maybe some things that you do have common ground on? So the common ground is that we both care a great deal about social justice. Um, And so making sure that the least of our brothers and sisters are taken care of, I think Desmond and I are completely aligned on that. Where we are different is our actual experiences and the capabilities that come from that experience. You know, I graduated Dean's List from the University of Chicago, and I was the first in my immediate family to go to college. Um, he went to DeVry, and I don't think he finished at DeVry. Um, I went on, went on to law school and graduated on law review. And I don't mean this smugly. I don't mean my edu- to take my education sort of like as, look at me, I'm so great. Although it would be a disservice to my parents who actually were pushing me to be somebody and to get that education. So I'm not going to be ashamed of my education. Um, But what I got educated, because I knew that there were fights that needed to be fought, and I had to be equipped to fight those fights. And that's why I got the top tier education that I got, because when I'm sitting on Capitol Hill, and there's somebody from Harvard, Yale on the other side, ready to take me on, I needed them to know that they were taking on an equal. Uh, when we when I was fighting for people who needed someone to defend them. So education and then the quality of the experience. You know, I worked on the Affordable Care Act. I worked on immigration reform. I worked on some of the most complex pieces of legislation um, that this country has had to confront. And we confronted that. We used those those moments in order to that experience. No one on the campaign trail could match and certainly not Desmond. And then we're also curious, still sticking to, you know, really the ward issues. What is your stance on ward level direct democracy? So, for example, the participatory budgeting and that type of thing, uh, because it, it sounds like from what you were saying, right, there, there's that the component of social justice and wanting everybody involved. And then obviously from your experience, right, how what's the best way to do that? So I I love this question because while I was chief engagement officer, I tried to introduce concepts of participatory democracy into our actual engagement on the budget. I couldn't get us all the way there. It was too big a budget. It was too big a a aircraft carrier to shift. But even Daniel Espada on the floor city council said this was one of the most participatory budget processes that we've had in the city. And I was incredibly proud of that. Um, I absolutely intend to use participatory budgeting for our our menu money. Um, And for people to know what that is, you know, the ward offices get a bunch of money that they can figure out how to spend on their own. Um, I actually worked with U of I, or UIC, which is sort of like the granddaddy of participatory budgeting. Like I can call Taya and say, Taya, come help me set this up. Um, And she will be delighted out of her mind to do that because we worked together on two budgets, two Chicago budgets to get that done. Um, And so that was, you know, I I'm really enthusiastic about the opportunity to do that. And then on a more general basis. Right. You know, my dad was a political prisoner in the former Yugoslavia. I can't tell you he came here like dreaming of democracy. Uh, You know, like more than anything, I'm a democracy builder. We govern with the consent of the people, not the other way around. And I am, you know, a populist in that sense. I want people to feel like they have ownership of their government because they actually do. Right. And as you've been campaigning and kind of pitching, you know, different images or visions of participatory democracy, have most people in kind of the fifth ward understood what that means? Or has there been kind of some education that you've had to do about what this would actually look like? So, you know, this ward is complex and diverse, right? So University of Chicago, Hyde Park, people know exactly what their political rights are, a huge, incredible voter turnout. They know whether we call it participatory democracy or not, they are empowered and know how to raise their voice to get things done, right? It's harder in South Shore and Pocket Town and parts of Woodlawn where people have feel disenfranchised, right? And so they may not be putting the label on it of participatory democracy or inclusive democracy, but what they're asking for is to be heard. And so what they're asking for is exactly that. 
Here's the thing that's important, and I've said this to people, and I used to say it to my staff when I was their boss. Just because you're heard doesn't mean you're agreed with. And so when I talk about participatory democracy, it is also important that I, as someone who has to listen to constituents from across this ward, right? So what Hyde Park wants may be different than what South Shore wants, may be different than what Hot Pocket Town needs, right? And the decision that I have to make as a governor is the judgment of what's doing maximum benefit, minimal harm. There are going to be times when under participatory democracy, Pocket Town, which is very small, 400 votes, they'll have the, 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 the smallest voice, but they may have the most important need. And so my job is to make sure that I am I'm hearing everyone, learning from everyone, and then striking the right balance so that people feel that justice has been done. As a lawyer, and particularly as a litigator, we used to talk about this all the time. As long as the process is just and fair and open, people can accept a decision that's against them. But it's when the process is unjust and you feel like you're disconnected, that's when that's what people get upset about. I don't have a voice. Um, and in, in my ward office, the people don't have a voice. So speaking to the diverse needs faced by different areas of the ward, I do want to turn to one specific issue primarily facing Woodlawn and South Shore, and that's the construction of the Obama Presidential Center. And for a long time, there have been calls for a community benefits agreement for those neighborhoods. And I want to first ask what your stance is on that CBA. And then more generally, what would you say to residents of the ward who are afraid of the possible displacement that comes along with that? First, I want the people who are afraid to know that I understand that they're afraid um, because they want, nothing's worse than to be afraid and have somebody dismiss your fear. Um, and there's a reason for the fear. You know, it's like sort of when people say, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. It's like, how can you be in America and not believe in that? Because they always come out 20 years later. And so I will not um, support displacement of existing residents. Um, and if, if you live there and, you know, you know, are paying your bills and being a good tenant. Um, I want you to be able to stay there. But what I cannot support are some of the parts of the CBA that was just produced um, that says every vacant lot has to go to affordable housing and that all new construction has to have 60 percent affordable housing. I think that there are businesses in South Shore that may need some of those lots. Um, and not developers, I mean, like retail businesses, child care centers. I've got to be just as worried about that part of the ecosystem when I talked about the economic ecosystem as I do housing. And I think requiring 60 percent um, affordable housing and new construction just guarantees that there will be no new construction. Um, and, guess, you know, it is a market economy. People are going to make decisions based on, you know, market influences. It's hard uh, because rents are going to go up. You know, there is not going to be a utopian solution to this. There are going to be people who will move. So what are some maybe tweaks that you would make to the CBA up front, at least, or, you know, in terms of negotiations, what what might you propose as kind of a counter offer? So I've already because I've spoken to Dixon Romeo and others at the CBA coalition about the two points I've specifically brought up. Um, you know, I can't vote for it if it's 60 percent. And I can't vote for it if it's saying that every vacant lot um, has to go to uh, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I also think there's another piece of this equation that um, doesn't get talked about. And that is what is the what is it that the middle class wants? Right. Because there's a, a organized voice for some residents in the community. And that organization, frankly, often comes from outside the community. But there are also people within the community who actually want their property values to go up. They want a more balanced sort of community. They want to see uh, the amenities on 71st Street that require that people be able to move into South Shore who have disposable income. And so you hear one side of the story because there's great organization in the, on that side, and I don't grudge anybody, but there is also the issue of people who don't have an organized voice but certainly have views and opinions and things that they want um, to be considered. I, I, I asked somebody who's talked to the middle class about this, you know, who's talked to just the regular folk who are 
paying their mortgages and struggling in their own way. Who's pay, who's, who's, who's talked to them. I think the other thing about the CBA that I think is sort of important in the other direction, we can't have a CBA for every neighborhood that's facing gentrification. And that's basically what we're facing right now. It's a whack game of whack-a-mole. If there are things in the South Shore CBA and they're sort of uh, duplicate or complement what's in the Woodlawn um, housing ordinance, maybe we need to have some citywide provisions, right? So the displacement, one of the things that I'm really strong on is the right of return. So if something breaks in the apartment, I want to be sure that when you've moved people out, they get to come back in after you fixed it. Because otherwise you're creating a, an environment where an unscrupulous landlord would be like, sort of like you could break a boiler yourself to get people to have to move out and then not let them back in. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's unique to South Shore. I think that could happen a lot of places. And so you want to prevent sort of the opportunities for that kind of unscrupulous behavior. I also though want to protect small landlords. You know, I, there are people with three flats and six flats in those neighborhoods and two flats. They're just regular people too. And this idea that like sort of their property rights aren't, you know, uh, valuable or protected. I, I, I gotta be honest. I find that a little hard to, hard to swallow too. So you've mentioned a lot about how you would love 71st street to look more like 53rd street in terms of commercial activity, but you've also addressed the fact that there are barriers to seeing investment in communities like South shore mm -hmm. and mayor Lightfoot's invest Southwest initiative has got a lot of criticism for being slow to act, not delivering quite as forcefully as promised. So what do you think are the most significant barriers to robust investment in the South and West side neighborhoods? And how would you as aldermen go about getting past those barriers? I think, again, you come back to the very hard conversation about the unbalanced economics of these neighborhoods. You can build the most beautiful shops. You can build anything. But if people don't have the income to go to those shops, then those shops aren't going to survive. They are shops that don't survive in Hyde Park. And there's people with disposable income in Hyde Park, right? It's shops that don't survive in Lincoln Park, right? And so I think that one of the things that we have to do that was not part of Invest Southwest and is something that I have been a broken record on is we also got to get people jobs. And that was not part of the jobs were almost a, not an afterthought because it wasn't an afterthought, but the jobs will come if we do invest Southwest and Auburn Gresham is probably the farthest ahead of the corridors. Like we do all this and jobs will come and you'll have jobs in the shops and jobs here and jobs there. No, I need people with jobs that are like, you can support a family. I need people with jobs with benefits. I need people with jobs that like on the weekends, they got time to actually like walk down the street and go to the shop, you know, spend a little extra at a restaurant, you know, not you'd be like my dad, I could have made that chicken for $4, right? It's okay, but you didn't, right? So it's like South Shore, Grand Crossing, parts of Woodlawn, you know, they have like double digit unemployment rates still. So you could build anything. People have jobs to, to accommodate that. You have to know too. I, I remember 71st Street. I'm old, right? 71st Street was hopping, <laughs> you know, and it was a place where you went. You It was a destination. There was shops and, you know, stores. You could buy clothes. I mean, it was like an incredible street. And I, and it's, that's, I have the nostalgia for that 71st street that a lot of residents of South Shore have, but you're not going to get there just through Invest Southwest. You have to have a parallel jobs program, which I think we didn't talk about enough in the city. Um, and, and my colleagues will laugh when they hear this, because I was literally like, the, again, Tina with the jobs, um, but square one, you need the jobs. So that brings up another sort of question, which is, I think there's a pretty diverse range of opinions throughout the ward about the universities in itself. I'm just curious, what do you think is the proper relationship for a fifth ward alderman to have with the university? 
I think the Fifth Ward Alderman has to have a great relationship with the university, the Obama Presidential Center, the Museum of Science and Industry, and all of the big institutions in this ward. And if you don't have a great relationship with such important institutions in your ward, you're not able to serve your ward well. That does having a great relationship doesn't is not the same as saying I'm gonna do whatever you want. Um, you can have great, you know, you have friends that may ask you to do something, you're like, I ain't doing that, <laughs> you know, and so it is about having a really robust, genuine, authentic relationship with key stakeholders in this ward. They are a key stakeholder in this ward. And, you know, Hyde Park exists because of the University of Chicago and people can argue that all they want. Um, but it is one of the biggest employers in the city. Um, it brings a vibrancy to Hyde Park. And, and I fully expect to have a good relationship with them. One of the things you can do when you have a good relationship with somebody is also say you got spinach in your teeth. Like you can't do that. Like, like you, you know, you see if you want to do X, Y, or Z, right. You know, use those lots in Woodlawn to build like, you know, luxury housing, which is not what they plan to do. Um, but I would speak up, right. And say, this is a consequence of that. And one of the things I, someone asked me the similar question, I said, you know, UFC made me, they know I know how to think. They taught me how to think, you know, I'm not going to be somebody that's just going to roll over on, on this um, and be, you know, not be able to do critical thinking. But I also am somebody you can work with to figure out the win-win solution so that we can achieve progress and not just, you know, sort of stay in place. So last year we had older person, Leslie Hairston on who, who gave us a little bit of color about the history of the kind of the fifth ward and UFC and just how that relationship has changed over time. I'm curious to hear what your reactions are on that subject, just how the relationship has changed and where you hope it to go. Yeah. So I graduated from UFC in 1984. Yeah, everybody do the math. I'm old. It was a very hostile is not the right word, but it was a little bit more than tense <laughs> uh, relationship between the university and Woodlawn. And it was a little bit, uh, I felt that there was a sense of, we don't have a responsibility to, to the people of Woodlawn. Part of it was the community said, don't come past here. But then at the same time, you tell me not to come past here. And then you're mad at me when I do come past here. Right. So it's a little bit of a catch 22. And I think Hannah Gray was the president at that time. I think she was like, whatever, and threw her hands up. I have a lot of faith that President Olivier Satos has a different mindset. Um, you know, he's got the University of Chicago Berkeley pedigree like I do. Berkeley changes you. Um, Berkeley makes you actually believe that you must <laughs> make the world a better place. And, and I think that he's bringing back a lot of those community sensibilities from Berkeley. And, you know, and I, I, I really want to give him a, a chance to make the University of Chicago the kind of partner it can be. And I want to be his partner in making that happen. I don't want to have I don't need unnecessarily hostile relationships, you know, and I think anybody who thinks that the way you get things done is just by fighting with each other. You know, it doesn't work that way because even wars end at a negotiation table. You've got to be able to sit and talk to each other. Right. And so as we think through your campaign here and kind of the, the types of listeners that we have, a lot of them are students, you know, a lot of them are either, you know, this is going to be the first time they vote in anything, they're new to the city. What would your pitch be for your candidacy, specifically to students at the university who, you know, this is the first time they, they are civically engaged? One, I survived the Common Core, right? <laughs> so, which I love. Okay, I love the Common Core, but I survived it. Uh, so, you know, just on that sort of like compatriotism, you know, throw me a bone. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, the it's one of the other things that's very different about me and my opponent. Um, I'm the independent candidate. I'm not supported by special interest. I'm not supported by the party establishment. I've come this far on my own telling a story and speaking, I think, sort of reasonably and thoughtfully and intelligently to my, 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 my constituents. You know, I owe nobody but the voters. And even my friends who wrote me checks, they don't even live in Chicago, so they owe, owe them nothing either. What I owe is to the voters of this ward. And so if what you want is an independent older person who you know has the ability to think through any problem that comes her way, 
Um, and to think through with not just, you know, sort of like smarts, but with heart and understanding because I am from the hood. I grew up in Roseland, right? And so I understand the struggle. I understand the opportunity. I am independent. I've got experience that no one else has. And I've been effective in everything I've done in my life, um, including making it this far in this race with very little support behind me. And so I hope you'll vote for it. They'll vote for independence and sort of the integrity that comes with that independence. Well, great. Were there any other issues that we hadn't covered that you wanted to say anything about? Yeah, no, I think I talked a lot. So I think I, I'm, 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 I, I hope that there were, I covered everything that you were hoping to cover. And uh, We do actually have one more question. It might be our hardest question, which is what restaurant is your favorite place to get non-deep dish pizza at? In Hyde Park or anywhere? Anywhere. Can be anywhere in Chicago. Oh, man. Actually, technically, our other co-host who's helping us with audio levels today, he chose a place that was in a suburb, which I kind of felt was a stretch, but interpret the question as you will. Okay, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to do two. <laughs> <laughs> so I love Asione in in, in mm. Hyde Park. I, I think when you go into Asione, you see all of Hyde Park in it and a lot of the south and west side in it because people come from places there and it's a place where you could be relaxed whoever you are. And I love that part of Asione and the diversity of his staff. And then my favorite restaurant in Chicago is actually in Lincoln Square. Garcia's is the best Mexican food mm. in Chicago and it's like their, their tortilla soup to die for. So <laughs> great. Yeah, I think, I don't know. Do you have a, Jeff, do you have a favorite non-deep dish pizza place yet? I love Hyde Park. And I, I mean, I love pizza and I love restaurants in Hyde Park. And I actually do love deep dish. So I've eaten a lot of deep dish since moving here. But I'm telling you, there's something special about that Neapolitan style at Nella. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nella's that, that there is some delicious pizza there. I'm also going to do a plug for Jade Court because Jade Court has some of the most phenomenal Chinese food. And it's not your traditional, typical like, you know, cheap to carry out places. Actually, some really good food at Jade Court. Well, thank you a lot for joining us. I know I can speak as a student and as a new Chicagoan that it's been pretty hard to get decent, reliable information about this race that's not surface level. So coming on and having these sorts of conversations with us is really important, especially for student voters. And I, I do appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all and to speak with, you know, the, the new U of Sears. Uh, you know, I appreciate you. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out our interview with Desmond Yancey to be fully informed on the candidates facing the fifth board. Shout out to Eric Gepper for production and editing on this episode as well as Olivia Dupriel for logo design and the team at University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it and let your friends know. You can also follow us on Twitter by searching the podcast name or the handle Tweet Your Alderman. That's your spelled you are. As a reminder, early voting is open now, so be sure to make your voice heard on or before April 4th. Here in the 5th, the early voting site is the Southside YMCA. But you can also vote at the downtown super site at 191 North Clark or the election board offices at 69 West Washington. On March 29th through 31st, you can also vote right on campus at the Reynolds Club. We hope these episodes have helped you make an informed choice. And as always, we'll catch you next time.